Chapter Seven of Anna Karenina, Book Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Constance Garnett. Book Three, Chapter Seven. Stepan Arkadyevitch had gone to Petersburg to perform the most natural and essential official duty, so familiar to everyone in the government service, though incomprehensible to outsiders. That duty, but for which one could hardly be in government service, of reminding the ministry of his existence, and having, for the due performance of this right, taken all the available cash from home, was gaily and agreeably spending his days at the races and in the summer villas meanwhile dolly and the children had moved into the country to cut down expenses as much as possible she had gone to ergushevo the estate that had been her dowry and the one where in spring the forest had been sold it was nearly forty miles from levin's pokrovsko the big old house at Ergushevo had been pulled down long ago, and the old prince had had the lodge done up and built on to. Twenty years before, when Dolly was a child, the lodge had been roomy and comfortable, though, like all lodges, it stood sideways to the entrance avenue and faced the south. But by now this lodge was old and dilapidated. When Stepan Arkadyevitch had gone down in the spring to sell the forest, Dolly had begged him to look over the house and order what repairs might be needed. Stepan Arkadyevitch, like all unfaithful husbands indeed, was very solicitous for his wife's comfort, and he had himself looked over the house and given instructions about everything that he considered necessary what he considered necessary was to cover all the furniture with cretan to put up curtains to weed the garden to make a little bridge on the pond and to plant flowers but he forgot many other essential matters the want of which greatly distressed darya alexandrovna later on in spite of stepan arkadyevitch's efforts to be an attentive father and husband he never could keep in his mind that he had a wife and children he had bachelor tastes and it was in accordance with them that he shaped his life on his return to moscow he informed his wife with pride that everything was ready that the house would be a little paradise and that he advised her most certainly to go his wife's staying away in the country was very agreeable to Stepan Arkadyevitch from every point of view. It did the children good, it decreased expenses, and it left him more at liberty. Darya Alexandrovna regarded staying in the country for the summer as essential for the children, especially for the little girl, who had not succeeded in regaining her strength after the scarlatina and also as a means of escaping the petty humiliations the little bills owing to the wood merchant the fishmonger the shoemaker which made her miserable besides this she was pleased to go away to the country because she was dreaming of getting her sister kitty to stay with her there kitty was to be back from abroad in the middle of the summer and bathing had been prescribed for her Kitty wrote that no prospect was so alluring as to spend the summer with Dolly at Ergushevo, full of childish associations for both of them. The first days of her existence in the country were very hard for Dolly. She used to stay in the country as a child, and the impression she had retained of it was that the country was a refuge from all the unpleasantness of the town, that life there, though not luxurious, dolly could easily make up her mind to that was cheap and comfortable that there was plenty of everything everything was cheap everything could be got and children were happy but now coming to the country as the head of a family she perceived that it was all utterly unlike what she had fancied the day after their arrival there was a heavy fall of rain and in the night the water came through in the corridor and in the nursery, so that the beds had to be carried into the drawing-room. There was no kitchen-maid to be found. 
of the nine cows it appeared from the words of the cowherd woman that some were about to calve others had just calved others were old and others again hard uttered there was not butter nor milk enough even for the children there were no eggs they could get no fowls old purplish stringy cocks were all they had for roasting and boiling impossible to get women to scrub the floors all were potato hoeing driving was out of the question because one of the horses was restive and bolted in the shafts there was no place where they could bathe the whole of the river bank was trampled by the cattle and open to the road even walks were impossible for the cattle strayed into the garden through a gap in the hedge and there was one terrible bull who bellowed and therefore might be expected to gore somebody there were no proper cupboards for their clothes what cupboards there were either would not close at all or burst open whenever any one passed by them there were no pots and pans there was no copper in the wash-house nor even an ironing-board in the maid's room finding instead of peace and rest all these from her point of view fearful calamities darya alexandrovna was at first in despair she exerted herself to the utmost felt the hopelessness of the position and was every instant suppressing the tears that started into her eyes the bailiff a retired quartermaster whom stepan arkadyevitch had taken a fancy to and had appointed bailiff on account of his handsome and respectful appearance as a hall porter showed no sympathy for darya alexandrovna's woes he said respectfully nothing can be done the peasants are such a wretched lot and did nothing to help her the position seemed hopeless but in the oblonsky's household as in all families indeed there was one inconspicuous but most valuable and useful person marya filimonovna she soothed her mistress assured her that everything would come round it was her expression and matvey had borrowed it from her and without fuss or hurry proceeded to set to work herself she had immediately made friends with the bailiff's wife and on the very first day she drank tea with her and the bailiff under the acacias and reviewed all the circumstances of the position very soon marya filomonovna had established her club so to say under the acacias and there it was in this club consisting of the bailiff's wife the village elder and the counting-house clerk that the difficulties of existence were gradually smoothed away and in a week's time everything actually had come round the roof was mended a kitchen-maid was found a crony of the village elders hens were bought the cows began giving milk the garden hedge was stopped up with stakes the carpenter made a mangle hooks were put in the cupboards and they ceased to burst open spontaneously and an ironing-board covered with army cloth was placed across the arm of a chair to the chest of drawers and there was a smell of flat irons in the maid's room just see now and you were quite in despair said marya filomonovna pointing to the ironing-board they even rigged up a bathing-shed of straw hurdles lily began to bathe and darya alexandrovna began to realize if only in part her expectations if not of a peaceful at least of a comfortable life in the country peaceful with six children darya alexandrovna could not be one would fall ill another might easily become so a third would be without something necessary a fourth would show symptoms of a bad disposition and so on rare indeed were the brief periods of peace but these cares and anxieties were for darya alexandrovna the sole happiness possible had it not been for them she would have been left alone to brood over her husband who did not love her and besides hard though it was for the mother to bear the dread of illness the illnesses themselves and the grief of seeing signs of evil propensities in her children the children themselves were even now repaying her in small joys for her sufferings 
those joys were so small that they passed unnoticed like gold in sand and at bad moments she could see nothing but the pain nothing but sand but there were good moments too when she saw nothing but the joy nothing but gold now in the solitude of the country she began to be more and more frequently aware of those joys often looking at them she would make every possible effort to persuade herself that she was mistaken that she as a mother was partial to her children all the same she could not help saying to herself that she had charming children all six of them in different ways but a set of children such as is not often to be met with and she was happy in them and proud of them End of chapter seven